Uh, take your Bibles, and if you would, remain standing if you're able, and go to Romans 8.28. Romans 8.28, the, the message is entitled, The Good of It All. The Good of It All. How many can quote Romans 8.28 by heart? Amen. I can. It's my life verse, one of my life verses. I've got a lot of life verses. Amen. This one has been sitting on my desk since uh, I forget how long it's been. Uh, honey, did you buy that plaque for me, that Romans 8.28 plaque? sitting on my desk and it sits there all the time every day and I need to pay more attention to it when I go through difficulties because sometimes I forget what it says. Amen. Romans 8 28. Everybody there say amen. amen. Any old me's? Oh boy. Amen. Oh boys. Oh me's. Amen. Me oh my's. Romans 8, 28, and I want you to read that with me together. If you did look at the bulletin, the message is entitled, The Good of It All. Amen. Amen. Romans 8, 28, read it together with me. It says, And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. Now, this has been one of my favorite verses for many, many years. However, I must confess that I don't always agree with it. <gasps> Preacher, you don't agree with the word of God? Uh, more, it doesn't agree with me, I should say, amen. And although it's true and the word of God says what it says, sometimes my view and my focus is off. And I don't understand that all things are working together for good. I do love God, amen, but sometimes I have to question my love in view of what the Bible says. And it says, uh, all that love God and who are the called according to his purpose. And he has a purpose there in verse 29, for whom he did for no. He also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his son. And so God is using the all things in your life, my life, to make us to look more like Jesus. And uh, sometimes we don't like the all things. Amen. My view may be off. My focus may be off. Let me read you something that I read uh, back in August of 14 out of the devotional called Rooted. Uh, it says, during difficult times and trials, the difference between those who trust God and those who do not is found in the way they view those trials. Now, if you view the trials as good and working for good, then you'll say, praise God for it. Godly Christians have the same problems, heartbreaks, and even tragedies as everyone else. Did you know that? Amen. We have the same problems that unsaved have. We, we're not immune to that, nor are we exempt popular, uh, contrary to popular beliefs. Some of y'all think, well, I get saved, I don't got no more problems. <laughs> ha, 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 ha. You actually have a whole lot more. But you don't have the problem of going to hell. Amen. They are not somehow exempt from suffering as Christians, but they view their difficult circumstances through the lens of an understanding of God's love and purpose for their lives. Of course, many things happen that are painful and hard for us to endure, yet those circumstances do not mean God has forgotten us or forsaken us. He makes all things work together for good. This helps us understand that even the most difficult things we experience are a necessary part of his plan. It ends by saying, view your problems and difficulties as something God can and will use to make you a better servant for him. We're going to talk this morning about the good of it all. The good of it all. The Bible states, and we know. And we know. So Paul is saying, we, we know this already. And we know that all things work together for good. And so the good of it all. Father, bless now in these next moments that we have this morning to share together. Lord, I am reminded that in an audience of this size and this diverse uh, background, there are going to be many that are going through trials and hard times and, uh, Lord, uh, situations that may be difficult. 
Lord, I'm reminded that we serve the God of Abel. And Lord, you're able to do exceedingly abundantly above everything that we ever ask or think. And so, Lord, I pray you would, uh, Lord, bless in the service today. Fill me with your Holy Spirit. Allow me to encourage the hearts that maybe are struggling today with some of the all things of God. Uh, Lord, lift up a, a heart that's ready to stumble. Lord, uh, lift up a heart that's weary today. Lord, encourage that man, that woman, that boy or girl today that that just says this one more thing that I just cannot uh, stand or tolerate. Lord, help that man, woman, boy, or girl to understand that we know all things work together for good. Uh, help them to put this in the, uh, the recipe of godliness and Christianity that uh, you're trying to make in their lives, that they may be conformed to the image of your dear son. Lord, as saints today, help us to uh, be edified and built up. And Holy Spirit of God, walk the aisles of this church and minister to every heart that is here today. If there's one today lost without Jesus Christ, if today they are not sure that heaven is their home, Lord, press upon their heart the great need of being born again. Press upon their heart the, 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 eternity, the eternity that awaits them without Christ in a place called hell that you don't desire for them to have. And that's why, Lord, you so love them that you gave your only begotten son. And they would truly just believe and trust by faith they can be saved. Lord, I pray that you would uh, anoint uh, this service, uh, that we will truly say it's been good to be in your house today and leave refreshed with the view of all things that are happening in our lives at this present time. And Lord, we might be blessed in a marvelous and miraculous way, save lives, change hearts, Lord, bring us to a point of praising and worshiping you because you're truly worthy of our praise. When it's all said and done, may you get the glory and the honor in Jesus' name. Amen. God. How many of y'all know what I'm talking about when I, when I say that you don't always like the all things of God? How many say amen? amen. Uh, you have certain things happen in your life and you think, Lord, why me? Lord, why now? Yeah, that's right. And uh, when you think, why me? Why now? The next thought you should have is, why not you? Why not you? Amen. Uh, God knows what he's doing. He knows what he wants to do. Paul here writing to the church at Rome, he is writing in regards to uh, their Christian walk and their Christian characters, building them up, giving them a, a doctrine on uh, righteousness uh, from the front uh, to the end of this epistle. When you come in here to chapter number 8, he's beginning to talk about uh, the living that we should have. Notice verse 1. He says, there is therefore now no kind condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus who walk not after the flesh but after the spirit. So Paul is saying, you know what? Uh, you're not under the condemnation now. You're saved. Amen. amen. And if you like that, say amen. amen. It's good to be saved. Amen. amen. And uh, he said, there's no condemnation. that You don't have the wrath of God hanging over you anymore. It's exciting to be saved. Amen. amen. And if you don't think it's exciting to be saved, try being lost. Oh, yeah, that's right. Amen. Hey, having the, the condemnation over your head of going to hell, that, is, that wasn't pleasing for me. That brought me under conviction. That brought me into the presence of wanting to get saved. That brought the power of God on my life and the, the predicament of hell being my destination didn't thrill my soul. And I said, look, I got to do something about that. I, I do not want to go to this place called hell. It is not for me. But Paul says now there's no condemnation. He says, no condemnation. He said, if you're uh, going to walk after the spirit, not after the flesh, there's no condemnation there. Amen. By the way, if you walk after the flesh, you got plenty of condemnation. Amen. amen. Just that hell is not one of them. Amen. amen. And uh, he goes down there talking about your spiritual as, as opposed to a fleshly lifestyle. Now in verses 1 through 11. Then uh, verses uh, uh, 12 through 17, he begins talking about uh, the debtors that we are now to the spirit of God and how we ought to live by the spirit and not to the flesh. And uh, uh, kill off that old flesh, amen. Then verses 18 uh, through 28, he's talking about us uh, waiting for the redemption of our body and uh, talking about creation there in verse 18. Likewise, I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. Talking about we're going to get a glorified body, but also creation is going to be renewed. For the creature, uh, the earnest expectation of the creature waited for the manifestation of the sons of God. He's saying we're waiting for that. 
For the creature was made subject to vanity, not willingly, but by reason of him who hath sub subjected the same in hope, because the creature itself uh, shall be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation groaneth and trilleth in pain, in pain together until now. He said, not only are we going to get a makeover, creation's going to get a makeover. Amen. And uh, he begins to go down here talking about our hope and our prayer life. Verse 26. Likewise, the Spirit also helpeth our infirmities. He says, you know what? The Spirit of God is going to help our weaknesses, our inabilities to pray right. How many of y'all get to the point sometimes you don't know what to pray for? You don't even know how to pray. You start saying, Lord, I don't even know what I need. I know I need help. I know I'm struggling. Lord, I, don't need, I, I, I can't even frame the words to say what I need. Don't feel bad because the Holy Spirit is right there saying, that's okay. I know exactly what you need. And I know exactly what God wants you to have. And so you don't have to worry about that. Frame the words the best way you know how. Give God your heart the best way you know how in this situation. Get it all out and I'll take it. I'll translate it exactly what it needs to say. Because God knows your heart. He says, likewise, the Spirit also helpeth our infirmities, for we know not what we should pray for as we ought. If we knew that, amen, we wouldn't need the Holy Spirit's power. But the Spirit itself maketh intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. He gives a silent word to God and says, this is what they need. Notice this, and he that searcheth the hearts north, what is the mind of the Spirit, because he maketh intercession for the saints according to the will of God. He's going to intercede on our behalf according to the will of God. He's going to say, this is what they need. I, I know they asked for a six-figure pan job, Lord. I, I know that's what they asked for, but they really don't need that. Yes, sir. But they really need just enough money to get by because they'll squander the rest. They might even try to go play lottery. Yeah, some of y'all looking like, oh, I'm not supposed to do that? No, you're not supposed to do that, but that's another message. <laughs> and then he says, and we know, after getting our prayers settled out, uh, knowing what's going on, knowing the Spirit of God is searching our hearts and making intercessions according to the will of God, he says, and we know all things work together for good. He says, not only is God helping with our prayer life, but our predicaments also are a power of God's thing that we need to make sure we understand. All things work together for good. They don't always seem good. They don't always appear good. They don't always taste good. They don't always look good. They're not always good. But God says they work together for good. Now let me show you how the average Christian views some of the all things in their life. Come here, G2. Now, in my family, we love oatmeal cookies. G2 especially loves oatmeal cookies. But now, G2, we're going to change the cookies around a little bit before we give it to you. Yeah. In cookies, they have some ingredients. Now, you need all the ingredients to make the cookie. Would you agree with me? Yeah. Now, the end result of the cookie is very good, isn't it? But let me see what is in the cookie. Well, first of all, it takes some oil, cooking oil. Let's give you a teaspoon of cooking oil. Would you like some, a teaspoon of cooking oil? Yeah, you, I bet you would. <laughs> I should have bought some for real. If I gave you a teaspoon of cooking oil, what do you think that would taste like? Make the face you think it would taste like. Uh, <laughs> but also in this is egg, raw egg. A teaspoon of raw egg. How do you think that would taste? It's not right. Also in oatmeal cookies is raw oatmeal. Lots of raw oatmeal. Okay? Also, it's brown sugar. <laughs> well, in, in my oatmeal raisin cookies, I like raisins. Lots of raisins. I like chocolate chips, too. Chocolate chips. How about there's some salt in chocolate chips, too? I mean, in oatmeal raisin cookies, there's some salt. There's also some white flour, but mommy, she likes to use that wheat flour because we're healthy now, right? So, some wheat flour. How's wheat flour taste? Good. He ain't tasted it, that's why. <laughs> also, you gotta put a little bit of water in it, so you like water, of course, I know you like that. And it's got some butter in it, some raw butter. How's the water, yeah, he likes butter, okay. So, you didn't like that, uh, mm, that oil too much. You didn't like that raw oatmeal too much. But guess what? All of that actually goes into 
oatmeal cookies. You didn't like that egg either, raw egg. Have you ever seen mommy put a boiled egg in her cookies? It doesn't work well, does it? It's got to be a raw egg. You didn't like the taste of that raw egg, did you? But guess what? All of those ingredients go in oatmeal cookies. Now, wait a minute. The Bible says, and we know that all things work together for good. Sometimes when certain things come into our life, it's like those raisins and those uh, the brown sugar. We're like, oh, God, I love this. Oh, this is good. This is good for me. I like this. But then we get that oil. And we're like, God, this is terrible for me. And then, then we get that raw oatmeal. And then we get that egg come in our life. And we say, God, I don't like raw eggs. I don't like this raw oatmeal. I don't like this salt. I don't like this. But all things need to go in the oatmeal cookies to make it. Hey, and then wait a minute. We're still not done yet. Now we got to take you, Mr. Cookie, and put you in the oven. And we got to heat you up. We call that trials and tribulations. We call that suffering. We call that sorrow. We call that sadness. We call that all the stuff that we don't like. We put the fire, put you in the oven. We turn the heat up, and you can't get out the oven. Have you ever seen an oatmeal cookie jump out the oven? <laughs> oatmeal cookies can't jump out the oven. They stay in the oven. They stay on that hot pan. <laughs> they stay on the sheet. On, on the sheet. How many of y'all ever saw one of your cookies jump up off the sheet? They sit there and they bake. And they get brown. If you leave them too long, they'll burn up. I've had my share burn up on me. I'm glad God doesn't let his cookies burn up. I'm glad God doesn't let his Christians burn up. I'm glad God knows how long to leave me in the pain, in the sorrow, in the suffering, in the skillet. I'm glad he knows how long it takes to bake me. I'm glad he knows all things work together for good. Hey, but wait a minute. They have something called now no baked cookies. They don't even have to go in the oven. Sometimes God just says, now you got all things in your life. You just need to sit down for a while. Just sit right there. Let me, I may have to chill you just a little bit, cool you off some. And God just leave you to yourself. You think, why am I all by myself, God? Why have you left me by myself, God? Why am I alone, God? And God, you can just, just, just chill. You'll be all right. You'll be all right. When I come back, I'll be able to eat you. You're called a no-bake cookie. I didn't have to put you in the oven at all. I didn't have to heat you up at all. I'd just leave you over there. You'd be all right. That's good. God has forgotten me. I'm all alone. No, I don't like to be alone. And God, why have you left me over here? You've forsaken me. Sometimes God has to do that to us. Uh, yes, he does, Pastor. He does. Sometimes when it comes to the all things, we don't like the individual ingredients. Sometimes we don't like the heat that it takes to cook the cookie. Sometimes we don't like the, the process of sitting over there and waiting a little bit, and waiting on God, wait on the Lord and be of good courage. He should strengthen our heart. Wait, I say on the Lord. We don't like to wait sometimes. I had fainted, David said, unless I believed to see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. He said, but I, but I did wait. And I didn't faint. And whether I'm a no-bake cookie or whether I'm a baked cookie, it took a lot of ingredients, a lot of all things to make me. And the Bible says, and we know that all things work together for good. Didn't say you got to like some oil. It didn't say you got to like a, a raw egg. It didn't say you got to like some oatmeal. It didn't say you got to like the ingredients. It says all things work together for good. Aren't you glad you don't have to eat some oil, Gregory? Aren't you glad you can go to the store instead of getting oil and flour and all these other things, you can just get you some oatmeal cookies already made? Aren't you getting hungry now? <laughs> go ahead. Thank you. Amen. What am I saying? I'm saying that God has to put some things in our life. He's got to put some ingredients in our lives. He's got to put some turmoil in our lives. He's got to put some hardships in our lives. He's got to do some things that we don't like. I don't like him anymore. Do you say, preacher, are you spiritual that you have reached that mark? No. No. I don't like going through pain any more than you. Hey, when I hit myself, guess what? I say, ouch, too. Ouch. You say, well, I don't say ouch. I say other things. But that's between you and God, what you say. <laughs> know what I say, man. Know what I used to say and what I don't say anymore. Well, let me ask you a question. Did, would any of those ingredients by themselves hurt G2 if he ate them? 
none of those ingredients would hurt him. God is not designing the th all things in your life to hurt you. God has designed the all things to help you. And the help he's trying to give you is to be conformed to his son, Jesus Christ. He wants you to look more like Jesus. And so when I look at this verse, and although I, I may not agree with it at all times, I must confess that it is right, it is true, and it works. And that yes, I need the all things of God. And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. We're going to briefly look at a, someone's life this morning that lived Romans 8.28 positively. Because you can live it negatively and you can complain and bellyache and moan and groan and gripe. And I tell you, you will be a cookie that tastes terrible. I mean terrible. And if you own my baking sheet, I'll probably chuck you in the trash. Amen. But aren't you glad that God doesn't chuck you in the trash? Aren't you glad that you can bellyache and you can complain? And God just says they just need a little bit more time in the oven. Uh, uh, you can bellyache and claim he, they just need to stay over there just a little bit longer. Uh, you can bellyache and you complain. He said they just need a little bit more of this or a little bit more of that or a little bit more of some of this and they'll be all right. And the longer you complain, the longer you'll be there because you're not done yet because you still need all things. Yes, sir. Amen. 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 Amen there is someone that did not complain. There is someone that positively lived his life. And uh, he even stated this way. God meant it unto good. Go to Genesis chapter 50 with me. Most of you know that's Joseph. Genesis chapter 50. We're going to look at some things in Joseph's life this morning. And uh, Joseph had some all things going on in his life. And if you like Joseph, you had some things going on. But at the end of the row, when Joseph had to say it all and surmise it all up, when the brothers came and said, he's going to hate us now, he's going to uh, hurt us now, he's going to do some things, uh, Joseph said it this way in Genesis 50 and verse 20. But as for you, talking to his brothers, Genesis 50 and verse 20, ye thought it thought evil against me. Joseph said, you know what? You tried to hurt me. You tried to do me wrong. You, you meant evil. You meant bad. But notice this, but God. Amen. Aren't you glad God steps on the scene in your life sometimes? And when people try to mean evil on you, when people try to do evil against you, but God. But God meant it unto good. Amen. Said so God took all that stuff y'all tried to do and God meant it unto good. Hey, let me tell you something today. I don't care what's going on in your life. I don't care how bad it is, how tough it is. God sees. Not only does God see, God loves you. God knows exactly how much you need today. And God knew how much Joseph needed. He said, you thought it evil against me, but God meant it unto good to bring to pass as it is this day. To save much people alive. He says, God not only meant it unto good, and it was good for me, it's good for you. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. He said, it's good for us all. Amen. Let me tell you today that God's got some things for your life that you're going through right now, maybe that you've gone through in the past, but he's trying to work something in your life. And you need to let him work it. Don't run ahead of God. Uh, don't be mad at God. Don't complain to God. Don't bellyache with God. Say, God, work with me. God, use me. God, use the circumstances. God, use the situation. God, use it. Amen. God, I know you mean it for good. Amen. I don't know about you. I don't always have that vision. I don't always have that view. Sometimes I doubt what's going on. Sometimes I, 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 I kind of get bewildered and say, God, what's going on? I'm trying my best. I'm trying to do this. And, and it just seems like I'm not getting anywhere. I'm not getting the answers I need. My wife is sick. My children have this. The church has got this. This is going on. God, what's going on? He says, I meant it for good. I meant it for good. If you'd lift up them glasses and see with some spiritual eyes, you'd see what I'm trying to do. You say, preacher, he says, but as for you, ye thought evil against me. What evil is Joseph speaking about? Well, let's look at it briefly. We're going to look at this really quick. Go back to Genesis chapter 37. Genesis chapter 37, because we've come a long way to 50. But if he says, you meant this for evil, what did he mean? Genesis 37, and uh, notice verse, verse 8. 
course, uh, Joseph has these dreams that God has given him, and uh, he's going to tell them to his uh, brethren and to his father, and the result is Genesis 37 and verse 8. It says this, And his brethren said to him, uh, Shalt thou indeed reign over us, or shalt thou indeed have dominion over us? Uh, yes and yes. And they hated him the more for his dreams and for his words. What am I saying here? Joseph had the evil of being viewed with contempt. They despised him. They looked down upon him. They said, how dare you say that? You're just a kid. You're young blood. That's nothing that you could do for us. Amen. You have nothing to show. They viewed him with contempt. By the way, there may be some people in your life to view you with contempt. You may be hated by others, but God could be meaning it for an overall good in your life. Sure. Say, preacher, but they hate me. They talk about me. And your point is, right, God could mean it for good. Right. All depends on how you look at it. God's going to work with God's going to work with or without your cooperation. Do you ever ask your cookies for their cooperation? <laughs> Can the potter say to the clay, why hast thou made me thus? I don't think so. Joseph had, to, uh, had the evil of being viewed with contempt, but it didn't stop there. Joseph had also the evil of being conspired against. Come down that same chapter in verse number 19 uh, and verse 18. And they saw him afar off even before he came near unto them. Uh, Joseph is coming to them to, uh, to be, uh, see, he's being sent by his dad. And notice what it says. And they saw him afar off even before he came near unto them. And they conspired against him to slay him. And they said one to another, Behold, this dream cometh. Come now therefore and let us slay him and cast him into some pit and we shall say some evil beast hath devoured him and we shall see what will become of his dreams. What happened? Joseph had, his, had the evil of being conspired against and friends sometimes we may be evilly conspired against at work, at home, in our sports, in our promotions, in our clubs, in the community. It may be evil all around us. Hey, they may conspire against us but God can mean it for good. Amen. God can take the worst of situations and make it good. Hey, he took the worst situation, given his life, but he resurrected from the grave, amen, for you and for me. Amen. He can take the baddest of situations. He took a woman with demons and cast him out, and she served him and ministered unto him. Had a demon man possessed, and he was cold and sitting at his right mind, he can take the worst and make it the best. That's right. Joseph had the evil of being viewed with contempt. He had the evil of being conspired against, but it doesn't stop there because God had an overall good he had in mind. Joseph also had something else. Come down to verse 37, uh, verse 23. And it came to pass when Joseph was coming to his brethren that they stripped Joseph out of his coat, his coat of many colors that was on him. Joseph had the evil of having his coat being taken. You say, preacher, what's so special about that? That coat was special. It signified something about Joseph, that Joseph was special. Hey, friend, let me tell you something. You may have somebody special taken away from you. You may have a special situation in your life taken away. You may have that special job taken away, that special child taken away. You may have your virginity taken away. You may be violated. You may have a lot of things taken away in your life, but friend, God can mean it for good. Amen. God can mean it for good. That coat meant that he was special. We may have some special things or some special people taken away from us. Some special privileges maybe. A special school taken away from us. Maybe a husband taken away. Maybe a wife taken away. Maybe a divorce and that daddy or that mama is not there. Someone special has been taken away and you feel like Joseph. I've been violated. Something has been taken from me and I don't like it. But God can mean it for good. God can mean it for good. Joseph had the evil of having his coat being taken away. You know, it doesn't stop there. Not only was he viewed with contempt and not only was he being conspired against and not only was his coat taken away, but he had something else. Come down to verse number 24. It says, and they took him, cast him into a pit, and the pit was empty. There was no water in it. Joseph had the evil of being confined. He was confined in this pit. He was waiting for a disposal down to be uh, either killed or sold. Of course, the end result, he was sold. You know, we may be confined in a situation that seems to be hopeless. Can you imagine the thoughts that Joseph went through while he was in that pit? What are they going to do to me? Are they going to kill me? Are they going to sell me? Are they going to leave me? Can you imagine the thoughts that went in his mind? I know they don't like me and they've conspired to slay me. 
but what about my, my daddy? And what about my, my mama? And what about my family? And oh, I, I'm, I'm confined in this pit. I, I have no, no control. What, what do I do? Oh, what's going on? God, what's happening to me? When you're confined, you, you wonder what's going on. You're restricted. You can't do anything. You can't go anywhere. You feel like you can't move. In that pit, he could go nowhere. He could neither go up. He could neither go down. He couldn't go to the right. He couldn't go to the left. He could just stay in that pit. He was confined. And perhaps today you feel confined. Maybe in a marriage. Maybe in a job. Maybe as a child you feel, feel confined at school. Maybe with your parents. Maybe with the rules and regulations. Maybe the things that you're going through. Maybe you just feel confined. Maybe in this church. I feel confined with the standards of this church. And it's just restricted. The pastor won't let us do this. He won't let us do this. Don't blame it on me. Don't blame it. Everything that's done in this church is voluntary. Ain't nobody signed a contract. Can I get an amen? Yeah. So what you do, you volunteer to do. I did not twist your arm. Pastor White, you're going to be my assistant, whether you like it or not. Ushers, you're going to count that money, whether you like it or not. Choir members, you're going to sing in that choir or not. You're going to wear those dresses down to your eyeballs. <laughs> down to your toes, I mean, that's your eyeball. <laughs> don't please don't wear them up to your eyeball. <laughs> Down to your toes. I'm going from the top to the bottom. <laughs> you all volunteers. But you feel confined. Say, preacher, always wear that. I don't feel confined. I can't wear a tie if I'm going to usher. I feel restricted in my neck. Amen. I, I, did I make you do it? Well, it's part of your status, but you don't have to usher. Amen. Amen. Some of you say, that's why I'm not ushering. Amen. <laughs> that's another message for another day. <laughs> Submit yourself, therefore, to God. <laughs> Resist the devil. <laughs> Joseph had the evil of being confined, and sometimes it seems like we are confined, but God can mean it for our overall good. But you know, it doesn't stop there. Verse 28, something else happened. It says, then there passed by Midianites merchantmen, and they drew and lifted up Joseph out of the pit and sold Joseph to the Ishmaelites for 20 pieces of silver. And they brought Joseph into Egypt. He went from being confined in the pit to being controlled as a slave. And he was not his own. He was sold. And you know, when something is sold, it's, it's your possession. When you buy your car, it's your possession. When you buy uh, things, they, it's your possession. And so you control it. Joseph now is being controlled. And you know, you may be controlled by a circumstance. You may be controlled by a situation. You may be controlled by your health. You can't do what you used to do. And I know I'm getting to that point. Amen. We went down that Grand Canyon yesterday. And I remember the days when I could walk down there and walk back up with my head high and lifted up. Oh, boy. I came up this time. My tongue was just down. The head was down. <laughs> Wasn't high and lifted up anymore. Was, whoo, whoo. Yes. You know, and it, it's kind of discouraging when you see 86-year-old guys coming past you with them little sticks. <laughs> uh, you see 90-year-old women coming by you. <laughs> What's the matter, Sonny? And <laughs> you over there. <sighs> I'll catch up with you. <sighs> Let me get that second win, amen. Hey, it's tough. When your health begins to control you and you can't serve God the way you used to, you say, I used to be, go door knocking all day long. Yes, sir, now I'm tired after 20 minutes. <laughs> I used to go all day knocking on doors. Brother Dad, we were talking about that yesterday, going knocking on them doors, amen. Hey, and getting people saved. But what happens? Health begins to take over and control you and confine you and constrict you, constrain you. And so they, uh, Joseph now is controlled, and so, but it's all being worked out for an overall good. We may be controlled by a circumstance, a situation, our health, a person, and it could seem that we are slaves to a situation or something, and we're being controlled by something, but God could mean it for our overall good. Yes, he did. Say, preacher, it seems like Joseph is in bad shape. Yes, he's been viewed with contempt. He's been evil conspired against. He's had his coat taken away. He's been confined. He's being controlled, and how could Joseph see the good of all this? 
I'll show you exactly how Joseph could see the good of all of this. Preacher, what kept Joseph going? And what's going to keep us going through the all things of our lives? The answer is found in verse number 2 of chapter 39. You find Joseph in Potiphar's house. And when the, when the going gets tough and when you feel the contempt and when you feel conspired against and when your coat gets taken and when you, you're confined and controlled, what's going to keep you going? The same thing that kept Joseph going. Chapter 39, it says, And Joseph was brought down to Egypt, uh, and Potiphar, an officer of Pharaoh, captain of the guard, an Egyptian, brought him of the hands of the Ishmaelites, which had brought him down thither. And notice this, And the Lord was with Joseph. How could he go? He had the constant of knowing that God was with him. It didn't matter where he was going through because God was with him. Hey, I don't know about you. I can go through a whole lot of things knowing that God's with me. Amen. How do you think Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego could stand in a fire? God was with him. How do you think Daniel could stand in the lion's den? God was with him. Amen. How do you think Moses went through the Red Sea? The angel of the Lord was with him and parted that Red Sea and confounded the Egyptians. Amen. How do you think Joshua did what he could? He said, you're standing on holy ground, son. I'm with you. I'm with you. He said, I'll never leave thee nor forsake thee. What kept Joseph going through the all things of his life? Be that they were hard, be that they were evil. He says, verse 2, and the Lord was with Joseph and he was a prosperous man. He had God's presence, he had God's prosperity and he was in the house of his master, the Egyptian. And his master saw that the Lord was with him. And the Lord made all that he did to prosper in his hand. And Joseph found grace in his sight and he served him and he made him overseer over his house and all that he had, he put it into his hand. He had the constant of knowing that God was with him. I call that, that's that chocolate chip that G2 likes. That's that brown sugar that G2 likes. Uh, that, that, that's the raisin that G2 likes. Those, those good ingredients, the old things are, are bringing together. And he gave me some good stuff here. The constants of his presence, the constants of his power, the constants of his love, the constants of his favor. And I can go through the old things knowing it ain't all bad. Amen. It ain't all bad. Amen. Yeah, I may have that egg. I may have that salt. I may have that oil. I may have that raw butter. I may have that heat. I may have all that stuff. Hey, but God's with me. It's all right. Amen. He had the constant of knowing that God was. God gave me a vision. God gave me a vision way back then. You may have conspired against me. You may have a contempt against me and constrained me and confined me, taking my coat. But I've got the Lord. Amen. I've got my God. Amen. Hey, I don't know about you. This has been a tough week for me. Amen. God bought me some, some, some chocolate chips. <laughs> God bought me some raisins and some brown sugar. Amen. This is a tough week. This, this is a tough three weeks for me. God bought me some brown sugar, some chocolate chips, because I had some oil before. I had some, 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 some egg before. I didn't like it. I had some heat before. I said, God, when does it end? He said, I got some chocolate chips coming. I got some good stuff for you, son. I got some stuff that's going to taste good. You'll be like, Mm. Now, now, I ain't got no sleep, but I still got me some chocolate chips. <laughs> I ain't got no sleep, but I got me some brown sugar. God said, I got some all things for you, son, and, and I know you don't like them eggs, and I know you don't like that oil, I know you don't like but I got some chocolate chips coming. I got some brown sugar coming. What keeps me going? The constant of God's goodness. The constant of God's love and God's power in my life. What keeps me going? That God's in it. Keeps me going. So I don't know about you. It's not been a smooth road for me. I asked my wife. It ain't been a smooth road for her either. What kept Joseph going? It was the constant of knowing that the Lord was with him through the, all the evil he found himself in. In other words, Joseph saw and experienced the goodness of the Lord. And that's how he saw the good of it all. That's why he could come back and say, hey, you meant it for evil, but God meant it under good. <laughs> he threw me in some chocolate chips and some raisins as you was throwing me some of that oil and some of that uh, butter and some of that other stuff that don't taste good. God threw in some good stuff. Well, I wish that was hot ended. But then Joseph had some more thrown against him. Come to chapter 39, notes verse 20. Doesn't stop there. And Joseph's master took him and put him into prison. Why? 
because Joseph's master, Potiphar, his wife accused him of laying with her and being immoral with her. And he came in and threw him in prison. She, she had some evidence. She had uh, his garment caught. Had his, the second time he got some trouble with that coat. It was a different one this time. Got that thing. And, hey, look at this thing in my hand. Joseph said, I thought I was done with that coat stuff. Look at his garment. It's got it in his hand. Hey, look what he did. And men, who are you going to believe? Slave or your wife? And we can say what we want to say, but I'm going to believe my wife over slave any day. Say, so preacher, you believe in slavery? No, but I'm just going to believe my wife. <laughs> so, what am I saying? He had some of the goodness of the Lord. But then Joseph had the evil of being convicted. We may be falsely accused and convicted of a crime that we did not commit. Serve time or unfair outcomes. But God committed for an overall good. And so as he has seen the goodness of the Lord and the Lord was with him, he had uh, the evil of being convicted again. And uh, again, what, what's going to keep Joseph going? And what's going to uh, keep us going through the all things of our lives when all things get tough and we don't understand it all? What's God doing? The answer again is found in chapter 39 and verse 21. But the Lord was with Joseph. Hey, I don't care how bad it gets. You may not like the eggs. You may not like the salt. You may not like the heat. You may not like that. Hey, but the Lord was with him again. Hey, you may not like the situation, but you got to like God. You may not like the hard times, but you got to love God. You might not like all the evil that's happening, but you got to love God. Why? God's always good. Got to love God. Again, what kept Joseph going, God was good. Verse 21, but the Lord was with Joseph and showed him mercy. Hey, man, mercy. And gave him favor in the sight of the keeper of the prison. Hey, you may have put me in the prison, but God gave me favor with the keeper. And the keeper of the prison committed to Joseph's hand all the prisoners that were in the prison. Whatsoever they did, there he was the doer of it. The keeper of the prison looked not to anything that was under his hand because the Lord was with him. And that which he did, the Lord made to prosper. Again, it was the constant of knowing the Lord was with him and the Lord was going to prosper him. And God's hand was on him through all the evil he found. Again, Joseph saw and experienced the goodness of the Lord. And he had to say, if it had not been for the goodness of the Lord, I would have perished. I would have fainted. I would have given up. That's right, Pastor. That's right. But I didn't because I saw the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Well, it doesn't stop there. It got even worse. Chapter 40, verse 14. David is in the prison, or Joseph is in the prison, and he's interpreting the dreams of the butler and the baker. In verse 14, but think on me when, I, when it should be well with thee. He said, just remember me, and show kindness, I pray thee, unto me, and make a mention of me unto Pharaoh, and bring me out of this house, for indeed I was stolen away out of the, <clears throat> the hand of the Hebrews. And, and here also have I done nothing, that they should put me into the dungeon. And the chief baker saw the interpretation that it was good. He goes on and gives another interpretation. Come down to verse 22. But he hanged the chief baker as Joseph had interpreted to them, yet did not the chief butler remember Joseph, but forgot him. And so Joseph had the evil of confiding in the butler and the baker, and the butler forgot him. So this evil of confiding in someone, and they let him down. You know, you may have confided in someone to help you, and they maybe have let you down. You know, God committed for your good that they let you down so that he can pick you up. Hey, God could be using something, and just like this situation, he forgot him for a time, but he remembered him. Be not weary in well-doing, for we shall reap if we faint not. God knows just when to remember you. God knows just when to pick you up. God knows just when to get you to the top of that trail, Jeff. We was about giving out, amen. I told the boys, I said, boys, if we can just make it up this trail, we get some ice cream, we get up there. Amen. Then I reminded myself, they closed at 5 o'clock. <laughs> and we were still on the trail. Yes, sir, yes, sir. And you don't have phone reception in the Grand Canyon. I pray, Lord, please make this phone work because we get these boys up this hill, they ain't got no ice cream. They're going to throw me back in there. <laughs> So I called the head, honey, if we're not back by such and such a time, get the ice cream. Right. <laughs> Eventually we'll come up, tongues hanging out, <laughs> tired, sweaty, stinky, 
dirty, dusty, dusty. but we did it. Yes, sir, we did, Master. And even if it's milk ice cream, <laughs> it'd be melted. I said, we're not back by such and such time. Get in that line because if we show it without no ice cream, my boy's going to hang me good. Amen. <laughs> and we made it before they closed and got a chance to get some ice cream. What was that? The goodness of the Lord. <laughs> but had not been for the goodness of the Lord. G2 said, look, I'm tired. Joshua and Faith, like, can we get on your back? I said, no, I'm about to get on y'all back. <laughs> I got on Joshua's back. Joshua said, Daddy, you're too heavy. <laughs> My feet too heavy, son. Amen. We can't walk up here no more. Uh, Joseph had the evil of confiding and being forgotten, but God didn't forget. We may have people forget about us, but God always remembers. Let me read you another devotion I read here recently. And uh, this, many of you probably have read this one. It says, life is filled with things that bring us frustration and annoyance. Often we may not be able to see or understand what God is doing in our lives. Yet even when we cannot discern the purpose behind what is happening to us, we can be certain and confident that God knows exactly where we are and that he knows exactly what he's doing. The process may be filled with things that are painful and difficult and sometimes frustrating, but the end result is something beautifully made according to God's design. God's purpose is for us to be conformed to the image of his son. And that requires that the things in our life that do not match the image be removed. Many times the things God must take away uh, for us to be like Jesus are things that we would rather cling to. In faith, we must be willing to release them to his purpose, trusting that he knows what the best end result will be. Joseph had to let go of everything that he knew. And it was not his control anymore. It was all out of his hands. Everything was not at his control. He was viewed with contempt. He was uh, controlled. He was conspired of, against. He was confined. His coat was taken. Uh, he was convicted. Uh, he had all this going against him, but he had the constant of knowing God. And God said, I have not forgot about you. I know you. I'm going to take care of you. And God is working all things together in our lives to accomplish his purpose of making us more like Jesus Christ. I don't like it any more than you. I'll be honest. I don't think Joseph liked it either. But you know what? He understood God meant it for good. You don't find him complaining. Why? He had the right view. God's in charge. And God's going to do what God's going to do to take care of me. He had the constant of the goodness of the Lord keeping him going, and the constant of the goodness of the Lord is what's going to keep you and I going as children of God. Amen. What happened? He was promoted after all the evil. Notice 41, 41. He was then promoted after all the evil things. 41, 41 says, And Pharaoh said unto Joseph, See, I have set thee over all the land of Egypt. Hey, that doesn't sound like that stuff to me. That sounds like the goodness of the Lord now. He was then not only promoted, but he was prospered, 42. And Pharaoh took off his ring from his hand and, and put it upon Joseph's hand and arrayed him in vestures of fine linen and put a gold chain about his neck, 40, 43. And he made him to ride in the second chariot, which he had. They cried before him, bow the knee. And he made him ruler over all the land of Egypt. He was promoted. He was prospered. But, you know, through it all, he still did not have his family. And so I'm sure there was a void in the next chapters until his brothers came to him. And you go over to chapter number 50, where we started. And I'm sure after testing his brothers and trying his brothers, he was overjoyed to find them coming to him, but heartbroken that they would think they would have to seek his forgiveness. Chapter 50, verse 20. Verse 19 says this, and uh, verse 18, his brethren also went and fell down before his face. They said, Behold, we be thy servants. Joseph said unto them, Fear not. Am I in the place of God? Hey, you might want to take vengeance on someone. Don't. Don't. But preacher, you don't know what they did to me. I don't, but God does. God took tabulation of what the brothers did to him. God took tabulation of what everybody did to him. And you don't find Joseph getting revenge. But what you find is for him saying, am I in the place of God? He said, but as for you, you thought evil against me. I thought I'd never see your faces again. I, I didn't understand how God was going to work all these things out, but I know this, he did. 
And am I in the place of God? No. You thought evil against me. But God meant it unto good. For what purpose? To bring pass as it is this day to save much people. He not only promoted him and prospered him, he provided for others after all the evil things that were done to him. And it was all for Joseph's good and for the good of his family. And so today you don't know what's going on in your life. You don't know why it's happening the way it is. But Paul said, and we know that all things work together for good. And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. For whom he did foreknow, them he did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his son. Goes on to say, whom he predestinated, he called. When he called, he justified. So God's got a plan. And although you and I may not like the things going on in our lives, the all things wasn't only for Joseph, but it was for others too, even those that meant evil against him. But Joseph said, you meant it for evil? God meant it for good. You know, what's God doing in your life today that you don't understand? You know, it could be that God's not really doing it so much just for you, but he's doing it for you and for someone else. It could be evil. It could be hurtful. It could be harmful. It could be many things. Joseph went through a gambit of things. But at the end of the day, you know what he said? God meant it for good. I don't know what's going on in your life, but I know that God wants your best interest to be taken care of for his glory and his honor, to make you more like Jesus. Amen. Let me tell you, friend, if you're here today and you're not saved, you're not a child of God, if you're not born again, if you die today and you're not sure that heaven is your home, God could be bringing you through all things to get you to this point today that you can get saved. Amen, that you can trust Christ as your Savior. You look back and you see the evil things. You see what happened. You say, what's going on in my life? What has happened? I, I, I don't know about you, but I, I crashed a car drinking and driving. A lot of events led up to the point that I got saved February 3rd, 1991. I walked in that church not knowing what to expect, but knowing I had a bunch of all things in my life. And I sat down and I heard the gospel and I said, woe is me. God, look at my life. I need to be saved. Amen. February 3rd, 1991, God said all the things so far have led up to this point in your life. And you need to get saved today, son. And you know what I did that day? I got saved. And I looked back on all those things and I saw how God was leading me along. And all those things that I, meant, I thought were meant for evil, all those things, God rolled them together and, and got some good out of that. I can go back and talk to people about how drinking and driving hurts you, how drugs hurt you. I can go back and, and say, God, man, those things were, were meant evil for me, but you meant it under good so I can help somebody else. So it's not just for you. It's for others. Joseph said you meant it for evil. God meant it for good. Notice verse 21. Now therefore fear you not. I will nourish you and your little ones and he comforted them and spake kindly unto them. And Joseph dwelt in Egypt, he and his father's house. And Joseph lived 110 years. That's a long cry from being thrown in a pit. That's right, Master. That's right. God meant it for good. Not just for you, Joseph, but for everybody involved. You touch a lot of different lives. And you go through a lot of different things. And you see a lot of different people. As you're going through the all things of life, don't get so self-centered to think it's all about you. God could be meaning it for good, for you, and for somebody else. That's good, That's good. If you're not saved today, here today, God loves you, yes, sir, he does. and you need to be saved. God has brought you to this point today that you could receive Jesus Christ as your Savior, but you can experience the love of God and be born again. And you could join in with like, like Joseph and say, they meant it for evil, but God, you meant it for good. Our heads are bowed, our eyes are closed, no one looking around. Our Father, we thank you for Romans 8, 28. Thank you that Joseph, along with yourself, was the epitome of this verse. Knowing that all things do work together for good. Lord, I pray that we'd say like Joseph, God, there are a lot of things in my life that I don't understand, that I don't agree with, that don't seem to be right, but Lord, I know you're meaning it for good. And Lord, help me to accept it. Lord, help me to understand it. Lord, may that be our prayer today. 
the all things that we don't really comprehend. May we just serve you and recognize the constant of your presence being with us like Joseph and just serve you in spirit and truth and you'll, you'll take care of the details. Oh God, help us not to be so caught up with trying to make it right and rectifying things and justifying ourselves, but Lord, loving you and serving you through the all things. And Lord, just surrendering our hearts to you today. God, if there's a man, woman, boy or girl in the sound of my voice, I pray that you would touch that heart today that needs to be saved. That man, woman, boy or girl that's struggling with a, a situation or circumstance, bring them to trust Romans 8, 28, that all things do work together for good. And may they say, but Lord, they meant it e evil, but you meant it for good. Blessed now in this invitation. With heads bowed and eyes closed and we're looking around, I'm going to be honest and say, preacher, if I died right now, I'm not sure I'd go to heaven. I'm concerned about it. But if I died this moment, I'm not sure that heaven is my home. Would you pray for me that I can get it settled today? I'm not sure that heaven is my home. I think I'm saved, but I'm not positive. Uh, preacher, pray for me. You raise that hand. All across this auditorium, man, woman, boy, or girl, you raise that hand. Preacher, I'm not sure I'm saved. I I'm concerned about it, but I'm not sure. You raise it up high and you put it right back down. And second of all, Christian, how about you? Do you have some all things going on in your life right now? Are they maybe similar to Joseph's but different? But there are situations that are beyond your control. There are situations that seem to have confined you or people may have conspired against you or seem to view you with contempt or maybe you've been convicted of something that is not true. And maybe you need to look at the constant of God, that God is with you through it all, like Joseph. And you raise your hand saying, Preacher, pray for me. Uh, I'm like that today. Pray for me. I've got some things going on in my life. Pray for me. I need God's help. I need to see the constant of God in my life right now. Hands going up all over the place. Would you add to these? I need, I need God's constant prayer. Amen. You may put them down. Well, if you're here today and you're not saved, let me invite you to come an old-fashioned altar. Say, preacher, I need to be saved today. If I died right now, I'm not sure. I'd go to heaven. And we'll get someone to help you out. Father, you see the hands that have been raised. You see the hearts that have been revealed. You see the story of Joseph, his life, and how closely related it is to many that are in this room today. But God, we want to see the constant that's involved, how you were with Joseph and you prospered him. And God, we want to have that same constant in our lives. We may continue to see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living and say, God, you meant it for good. Bless down the lives of your people today in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's all stand to our feet. Our heads are bowed and our eyes are closed. We're looking around. Diane pray, plays the invitational hymn. Maybe there's some things in your life you need to come down to an old-fashioned altar. Just say, God, some people have meant some things evil in my life, but Lord, help me to see that you mean it for good. Lord, help me to see that these people that are against me, the situation that's against me, that, Lord, help me to see the good in it. Oh, Lord, it doesn't taste good now. It doesn't feel good now. It doesn't seem good now. But, oh, God, help me to see the good in it now. Oh, God, help me to look back, see how you're working in my life. Joseph said, as for you, you thought evil against me, but God meant it under good. Hey, is there someone trying to hurt you? Is someone uh, trying to go beyond and defraud you? Is someone making life miserable for you? Are they viewing you with that contempt, uh, conspiring against you? Have they taken something special to you? Have they tried to control you? Try to confine you? Trying to convict you of something you've not done? Oh, think of the constant. The Lord was with Joseph through all the evil. The Lord meant it for good. And we know that all things work together for good. To them who love God. Them who are the called according to his purpose. I don't know about you, but I know that the hard times are there. But oh, I'm so glad that God gives me some power in his presence. So glad he gives me that chocolate chip. Gives me that raisin, that brown sugar in the midst of it all. God sends me something that makes me say the goodness of God. I can go on a little bit longer. I can go just a little bit further. I can make it now. God's my help. God's by my side. God's carrying me through. 
Where you at, Christian? Where you at, child of God? Do you see what God's trying to do? Do you see what God's doing in your life? As for you, you meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. again for your goodness. Thank you for your grace. Lord, thank you that we can look at Joseph's life and Lord, we can look at it in retrospect. It's a life that's been lived. It's a life that has been wronged in many turns, but at the end result Joseph said that God meant it for good. Lord, our lives are not lived yet. We can't look back in retrospect on our entire life, but we can look back on some of the things in our life. And God, help us to recognize that although some things may be difficult, it may be tough in some areas, God, thank you that we know that you're a God who loves us. You're a God that takes care of us. And that's the constant that Joseph had is the same constant that we have. You said you'd never leave us nor forsake us. You said you're with us always, even to the end of the earth. Amen. And so, Lord, I pray that you would continue to watch over us through the all things, strengthen us through the all things, carry us through the all things, Lord, and help us to see the good in the all things. In Jesus' name, amen.